There's nothing wrong with Christianity. Christianity is perfect. Christ is perfect. You, do you agree with me? Do, have you found a fault in Christ? Where does the problem lie then? Problem lies with us. The problem lies with us. Well, I've come today to set the tone for the season that we're going to be going into. And my subject today is going to be, if my people pray. Simple. If my people pray. And I, I'm hoping that we can spend a few minutes. It doesn't have to be too long today as I close this session in prayer and before we get into communion. But I want to challenge us today to, to pray. You know, when you can't do anything else, what should you do? When there's no way to turn and no one to help you on the earth, where, who should we turn to? And what should we do? Amen. Amen. Let's begin today with a word of prayer. Father God, we give you praise and we give you thanks. We give you all the glory for your word. Your word is precious. Your word is life and health to us. We pray, oh God, that our hearts will be receptive even now, oh Lord. Your word is already blessed. So open your word unto us today. Give us illumination. Give us understanding, oh God. And cause us to move from where we are to where we need to be. And we thank you for doing all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to me in your Bibles, please, to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 7. And our main text is uh, a verse of scripture that is quite familiar. Quite familiar. We pray it all the time. We talk about it quite frequently. And if it's all possible, you can memorize the scripture. Memorize it, please. Good to see Sister Daphne. Sister Daphne, God bless you, Sister Daphne, in the house of the Lord. And the text reads thus, if my people, I read it for the NIV, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Sometimes we have, a, we have a good intentions and sometimes we desire to do things that are legitimate, things that are worthy. But God does not allow us to do them. I think we have a little hum in the system. God does not allow us to do sometimes the things that, he, that we want to do. All right? David, the king of Israel, first, uh, second king of Israel, had in his heart to build a house for God. But God said, your intentions are good. Nevertheless, though your intentions are noble, all right, you are disqualified from building this house for me. People think that they are always qualified to do everything and anything in the house of God. But this event in David's life lets us know that we can come to a place in our lives where we are disqualified to do certain things, even in the house of God. And the, the, the ark of the covenant was moving from place to place as the children of Israel moved and they entered into the promised land. It was a, a mere tabernacle. And God said that God has, the Lord has given me rest and so forth. And I, I think that God's house, God's tabernacle is worthy of a better place. And, and Dave, in David's heart, he desired to build a house for, for God. And uh, God said, no, you, your hands are too bloody. There's too much blood on your hands. David was a warrior, see? David was the king that did conquering, and David also uh, committed some sins. It could be, could be that included as well, why David was disqualified from building the house of God. But David, knowing that he was disqualified, he said, listen, 
God said to him, David, uh, though you will not be able to build a house for me, I'm going to permit your son, because your intentions are good, I'm going to permit your son to build this house. And so, uh, knowing that God has, David, has selected Solomon to build a temple, a place for the Ark of the Covenant, before David's death, David decided that he was going to put all of the things in place for the temple to be built. David designed the plans for the, for the temple. He also conscripted manual labor from the people who were living in the, in the area. He also got skilled craftsmen. How many know that all labor is not skilled? All right? He got skilled craftsmen to do the work. He also uh, provided the materials for the structure. He got the gold and he got the silver. He got the iron and the bronze and all these things. And he made contracts with the people around, the nations around, to get lumber, to bring it down so that the temple, the house of God, could be built. But then David dies and Solomon has the responsibility to build this magnificent temple as it is described in the scriptures. All right? And the temple now has been completed. The work is done. And Solomon, as the king, has the responsibility to come forward and give, he was given the honor to dedicate the house of God to, unto God. And I want to pick up the reading from verse uh, chapter 7 a bit, and then we're going to come forward, just to give you some context. Because I'm, I'm discovering in these days that uh, people don't often read all of the chapters, all the books in the Bible. And sometimes when you bring a passage of Scripture, you have to go back and explain and show them what the, what the context is all about. So the temple has been built. The Solomon's temple has been built. And uh, when Solomon finished praying, now, let me back up a bit. Let me back up a bit. I want to pick it up from a little further, a little further back. We want to go back to uh, Second Chronicles chapter 5. Yeah, we're going to go back there. Second Chron Chronicles chapter 5, reading from verse 12. All right? Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly. The people are gathered together. Uh, the, the, Le the, the, the Levites are there, the worshipers are there, the priests are in place. And now he had, he had made a bronze platform five feet long and five feet wide and three cubits high and had placed it in the center of the outer court. And he stood on the platform and then he knelt down. So here is Solomon standing on the platform. You see where we got the idea of the platform? He's standing on the platform, and then he kneels down. And Solomon gets on his knees, and uh, I'm a little older than Solomon was back then. And Solomon opens his hands before the Lord. Can you picture this? I want you to envision what is happening here. All right? So he kneels before the altar in front of the, the uh, whole assembly, and he spreads his hands. All right? And he had made this bronze platform. And he stood on the platform, and then he knelt down, yeah, and then he says, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or in earth. You will keep your covenants, uh, a covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. All right? You heard that? He keeps his covenant with his servants who continue wholeheartedly in, uh, in his way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. The job is done. Now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promise you made to him when you said you shall never fail to have a successor to sit on the throne uh, before me on the throne of Israel. And if only your descendants are careful in all they do to, to walk before me according to the law, as you have done. And now, Lord, the God of Israel, let your word, the word, let the, your word that you promise your servant David come through. But will God really dwell on earth with, human, with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. This is, this is Solomon now talking to God before the people. 
But God, do you, can you really dwell? Will you really dwell with mankind? Will you dwell in this temple? You are so big. How much less this temple that I have built? Yet, my God, have, uh, have a, give attention to your servant's prayer and plead for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open towards the temple uh, this day, day and night. This place, which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer of your servant, the, your servant prayed towards this place. Hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven and dwell, uh, from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. So Solomon is crying out to God and he's saying, God, we know really that this is symbolically you are in this house. But we know that this house is too small to contain God, to hold God's presence. But what, you, what we desire for you to do is when we come into this house and we, we call upon you, please forgive us. And then he gets specific. And he says, when anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath and they come and swear the oath before your altar on this temple, then hear from heaven and act, O God. Judge between your servants and uh, your servants, condemning the guilty and bringing down the, uh, on their heads what they have done. And vindicate the, uh, the innocent by treating them in accordance with their innocence. And then he says, then when your people, uh, Israel, have been defeated by the enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back and praise your name, praying and making supplications before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive their sins. And verse 26 says, and when the heavens are shut up and there's no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray towards this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven. Let's move on, verse 28. And when famine or plague comes to this land, or blight, or mildew, locusts, grasshoppers, or when enemies besiege them in any of, uh, in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when they pray or plead, uh, or, or plea, it, when, sorry, when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people, all right, he says, being aware of afflictions, he says, when they spread out their hands towards this temple, then hear from heaven. And he goes on and he stipulates all of the details, all of the issues that could possibly arise in these times concerning the, the house of God and the prayers of the people. And so now we go on to, we're going to move on down to verse, to chapter 7, the dedication of the temple. When Solomon finished praying, verse 1, when Solomon finished praying, the Bible says a fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And when all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord. Okay? They said, he is God for his mercy, his love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered their sacrifices before the Lord. That's verse 6. And verse, let's move on down to verse, that's verse 4, verse 6 says, Then the priests took their positions, as did the Levites, and the Lord's mu uh, musical, with the Lord's musical instruments. You see how important it is for the musical instruments and the musicians to be in place? And then, uh, which King David had made for praising the Lord. Verse 7, and Solomon consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord. Verse 8 says, so Solomon observed the festivals, the festival that, at that time for seven days. So they had seven days of celebration at this dedication, this time of dedication before the Lord. 
Amen? And then we go on down now to verse 11. After Solomon, when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and has succeeded in carrying all that he had in his mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to Solomon at night. Did you hear that? The Lord appeared to Solomon at night. And this is what the Lord says to Solomon. He said, I've heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up heaven, the heavens, so that there's no rain or command locusts to, cut, to devour the land or send a plague among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and prayer and seek my face and turn from their sinful ways. He said, I'll hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. When we call on the Lord in sincerity, when we call on the Lord in humility, the Lord always hears us. I don't know what you are going through today. I don't know what you're facing today. It doesn't matter what you are facing today or dealing with. Whatever you are going through, if we come before the Lord God in sincerity, he hears us. God responded to the prayer of Solomon just about immediately. God hears the prayers of his people. The Bible gives us several examples, several illustrations of his people who prayed to him and how he responded. In fact, all the great names of the Bible are great because they have something in common. They were all people of prayer. They were all people who had communication with their God. The Bible gives us the example of Joseph. Joseph prayed in the pit. And Joseph prayed in the palace. And God gave Joseph visions and dreams. And he gave Joseph favor, even in the presence of his enemy. Moses stood in the gap as the intercessor, the mediator between the wrath of God and rebellious people. Of course, Moses and Aaron, and Aaron came at times. But when Moses stood before God and said, God, if you don't bring these people into the land that you promised them, the people will say that you're not able to do it. And God and Moses interceded and, the, and God relented. Through prayer, David got the victory over his enemies. David had Saul as his enemy and sought to kill him several times. Then he had his son Absalom, who threw him off the throne, slept with all of his wives before the whole nation. But God was with David, and David continued in prayer, despite the fact that he was in exile. The Word of God gives us another illustration. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah sought God's favor when the nation was in exile, or rather, they had just returned from exile, but they were reluctant to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And when Nehemiah heard that the people of God had gone back to the city, but the city was in shambles, Nehemiah got on his knees, the Bible says. He took time out to prayer. He took time out to fast. And the Bible says that Nehemiah got favor with the king. The king observed that something was troubling him. Listen, there's nothing wrong with people observing that something is troubling you when your heart is being drawn to God in prayer. People ought, to, people ought to see when you are in a season of deep meditation and prayer before God. The king realized that something was, was wrong. And Nehemiah was given permission to go back. And to lead the task of rebuilding the walls, the, the security around Jerusalem. The final act of Samson. 
the final act of Samson. Yes, Samson did a lot of bad things in his life, but the final act of Samson was to call upon God when his eyes were, were blinded and his hands were tied to the poles in the temple of the Philistines. And God said, and, and, and Samson said, Lord, give me strength one more time. And the Lord strengthened Samson one more time. And with his muscles, supernatural power was given to him. And he was able to pull the temple of the Philistines down, destroying the Philistines and, and the, the king and freeing Israel from the bondage that they were under. Prayer works. People, prayer works. Queen Esther. Queen Esther stood and she prayed when Haman threatened, he, Haman threatened a, a holocaust against the Jews. We won't get into all the details of the story. I'm just giving you an account of all of some of the people in the scriptures who did great things for God because they were people of prayer. The Bible tells us that when God arrested Jonah and put him in prison, not only in the, in the storm, but put him in prison in the belly of the fish. The Bible tells us that from the belly of the fish, Jonah did what? It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter how complex or how impossible it may seem. Listen, we serve a God of the impossible. And Jonah was not only in the storm, in the sea, in the belly of the fish, but he was there ready to die. But he cried out to God. God was his last resort. He couldn't see anything in the belly of the fish. He looked to the left and he looked to the right. The Bible says that all he saw were seaweeds and what you will find. Anybody, anyone cleans fish? The guts of a fish. Envision the guts of a fish that would normally be clean. There is where Jonah was. The Bible says, he said that all of the seaweeds were wrapped around his head. But it was there while he was wrapped up in the seaweed. It was there while he was wrapped up in decaying matter that he cried out to God. Your situation may seem dark today. Your situation may seem dismal. Your situation may be smelly. Your situation may be uncomfortable. But I come to remind you that if you pray, God is saying to you today in your situation, if my people pray, because of prayer, Daniel gained strength. Daniel gained wisdom. And he was able not only to have the wisdom and the discernment to, to interpret the king's dreams, but Daniel also had a powerful prayer life, uh, such that when he was placed in the, in the lion's den, uh, don't think that he was down there praying. He was down there worshiping God and giving God thanks. Uh, and I believe the lions joined with him uh, to worship God. Uh, they were too busy to eat. They weren't hungry any longer. Listen, when you call on God, you may have lions around you waiting to eat you up. But God will fill the belly up while you are praying. He will cause the lions to lose their appetite for you. Hallelujah. And even cause them to worship God while you're worshiping God. We need to call upon God in the face of the trouble. You know, this is why I started this morning by saying there's nothing wrong with Christianity. We have the keys. To heaven we have the keys that unlocks heaven's doors and the word of God tells us that the, 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 the cattle on a thousand hills are all the Lord everything that we see around us is God God controls the money in Chase Bank he controls the money in Capital One Bank. He controls the money in uh, Bank of America. He controls the money in Santander Bank. He con controls the money in Beth Page Credit Union. He controls the money in every financial institution. And as long as we walk humbly before the Lord, believe me, he will give us the desires of our heart. The Word of God reminds us that there's no good thing, no good thing that he will withhold from them who would walk uprightly before him. No good thing. 
Hallelujah. When God was looking for someone to go and to talk to his people. You know, I don't know why the Lord keeps showing me in these last few weeks and months that oftentimes when God is dealing with his people, it's because they were disobedient. When you read the Old Testament, we often see the children of Israel as people who did what was right, people who did what was perfect. People were always goody, too, too goody, 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 two shoes. But when God was looking for a man to go and talk to the children of Israel, to let them know that they need to repent of their sins and that he was going to send the Messiah, the Lord said, who shall I send? Who will go for us, the Lord said. And I thank God that the prophet Isaiah was mindful enough, was responsive enough, hallelujah, to cry out to God, here I am, Lord, send me. Another prayer. Lord, here I am, send me. There's a world out there that is waiting for you to come. He, the Lord is waiting for men and women to say, Lord, use me. Use me. We've been here calling in this church for workers. Yeah. We need altar workers. We need prayer warriors, more of them. We need our Sunday school teachers. We need more technicians. Yeah. We need ushers. Amen. Yeah. And God is waiting to hear, Lord, here am I. Send me. The Apostle Paul became the greatest church planter. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote the bulk of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul encountered every kind of challenge and opposition to uh, promoting the kingdom of God and to preaching the gospel. But Paul overcome every obstacle through prayer. Paul gives us a litany of trials of how many times he was beaten, how many times he was put in prison, how many times he was stoned and left to die, how many times he was in a shipwreck. But the Bible lets us know that each of these, shows us that each of these instances, Paul was in a, pr a praying posture. Yeah. We need to develop a praying attitude. I've been hearing some things unfolding in these days, and sometimes they, they become so overwhelming for me. I, I, my wife can tell you, these things, these things, when you hear them, they send you to prayer. They send me to prayer. Because when I try to look in the book, I don't see a solution, all right? When I try to talk to people around me, no one seems to have an answer. Only God can console us when we hear the things that are happening in the world. God can console us. So I often tell her, these things send me to prayer. Send me to prayer. Hallelujah. The prophet Jeremiah was criticized for speaking the truth. He was beaten. Prophet Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because day and night he wept over the nation Israel. He was put in jail. He even starved him for speaking what was true. But I thank God that in the midst of all of the opposition to speaking truth to power, in the midst of all of the, the beatings that he encountered, the Bible tells us uh, that the word of God was like a fire in his bones, in his body, and through the fire that it was in his bowels, and the tears that were flowing down his eyes over the nation of Israel, the Bible says that he was calling out to God, and that those tears and those prayers are what kept the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah and allowed him to fulfill his mission before God. But these were not the only ones who prayed. Jesus prayed, and Jesus overcame all of the temptations, didn't he? Yeah. Jesus overcame the temptations through prayer. Jesus prayed, and he turned some loaves and some bread into food that fed 5,000 one day. Jesus prayed, and every sickness was healed. Jesus prayed, and the dead were brought back to life. Jesus prayed in great agony as he knelt down in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, guys, come and help me for a little bit. I need, if I ever needed your strength, it is now. I need you to stand with me. He took his inside crew. Peter. James and John. And when Jesus turned around, 
all three of them were snowing. Couldn't you pray with me a little bit? Come on, come on, guys. This is the end of the rope. My people, if my people, if my people were prayer. Prayer is the believer's most potent weapon. I repeat that again. Prayer is the believer's most potent weapon. When you don't know where to turn to, prayer. When you don't know who to call on, prayer. When you don't have anyone to call on, hallelujah. Prayer has ways of opening doors that's being shut tight. Prayer takes, listen, prayer takes us in places that our physical body can't go. Mothers and fathers with students in school, all right? You can't go there, but if you pray, if you pray, if you pray, when you send your students off to school in mornings and you put them on the bus with the pedophiles and those who will look to abuse them, you can't go on the bus with them. If you pray, hallelujah, if you pray, the gunmen are on the streets, the gangs are on the streets selling drugs, and you don't know who's approaching your children. But if you pray, if my people pray, hallelujah, if we pray. Hallelujah. Through prayer, listen, through prayer, we can intervene into situations that our natural bodies and with our natural resources, we cannot. Prayer will take you into the king's palace. Prayer will take you into the White House. Prayer will take us right into Israel where the wars are taking place. Prayer will take the people of God into Ukraine and into the parts of the world that are impoverished. This is the power of prayer. This is why prayer is the greatest source of power that we have, or means of power. Yes, God does the work, ultimately, but we tap into God's resources through what? Prayer. prayer. It's like having a million dollars in the bank, but you can't find your credit card. All right? And you can't find your account number. And, and you, want, you need a little bus fare. You need how much is it? No, three, 290 or 390? Tell me, brother. <laughs> and you can't swipe your card. The money is there, but you have no access. Prayer gives us access to heaven's resources. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, through prayer, the believer has power over Satan over his demons and all the powers of darkness. The Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. How do we wrestle? We don't fight with gloves and knives. We fight through prayer, through the means of prayer. And if you need to get up in the morning at 2 o'clock, prayer. If the Lord wakes you up at 3 in the morning and you can't sleep, prayer. Hallelujah. If the Lord wakes you up at 6 in the morning and you can't get back to sleep, there's lots to do. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Hallelujah. Prayer takes the place, takes us places that we in our physical bodies cannot go. Listen, the only time prayer does not work is when we do not pray. Thank you, sis. That's why, that's why I said that Christianity works, Minister Mercy. This thing called Christianity, people, it works. But we need to put it into action. All right? Pastor David Anglada came here and he preached a message a week before um, uh, Sister Marcia. All right? That, that uh, we, miss, we need to put action to our, to our mouth, to our words. We need to put action to our words. So faith without works is dead. You say that you're a Christian, you're a believer in God, but you don't pray. You're missing out on everything that God has for you. You're going to fall short. You're going to come up short each time. And so we need to pray, all right? We, the only time that we do not receive from God, that prayer doesn't work, is when we do not pray. And when prayer is prayed with 
ungodly motivations. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 tells us, you do not have because you do not ask God. When was the last time you had a need in your life? Do you remember asking God about it? Did you say, God, God, I really need this, this thing to be resolved? So James is saying here that the times when we have needs in our life and we do not have our needs met because we did not pray. Then the other time that we don't have our prayer, our needs met is when we ask with, with bad intentions, bad motivations. And so our motivations must also be right in line with God's word. Now, if we want our prayers to be answered, we need to use God's prescription for prayer. Yes. You're listening now. We need to use God's prescription for prayer. And we don't have to come into a temple to prayer. We don't have to necessarily be in a crowd of people to prayer. Because the Bible shows us several instances where people prayed anywhere. The thief on the cross, all right, cried out and God answered him. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Paul and Silas were in a prison cell one night, and they prayed and sang praises unto the Lord, and God sent an earthquake that opened the prison gates and let them out, let, and, and potentially let them out. So prayer can be done anywhere. Listen, when you're driving in your car, talk to the Lord. When you're on the train, talk to the Lord. Brother, when you're driving the bus, talk to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In every situation. When you're at home feeling lonely, God is with you. A Christian should never say that they're feeling lonely. And I'm looking at a couple of single people in the house of God. We got a couple of single, I won't tell you who they are. We have a few single people in the house of God. And it's for the single people to find out who's single so that they can become friends or what have you. I'm not a matchmaker. But listen, you should never feel lonely when you are a child of God. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. He doesn't stand, be, he doesn't only stand beside us because he's a paraclete, all right? He dwells within us. And wherever you are, you, can, you need to talk, we need to develop and practice the presence of God where we talk to the Lord continually, all right? We need to pray God's way, however. We need to pray the way God prescribed. The first way we need to pray is in the name of, i say that again, prayer in the name of Jesus. Jesus said in John 16, 23, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. He didn't say ask in the name of Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad. He said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will grant it to you. And God gives us three answers. He either says, here it is. He either says, listen, I'm not giving to you, or he says, wait. And waiting is the hardest thing to do sometimes. All right, so the answer can come in three different ways. Secondly, we ask in faith. Matthew 21, 22, whatever ye shall ask in prayer, believe, and ye shall receive. Yes. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have it, and you shall receive it. Thirdly, when you pray once and you don't have, you didn't receive what you got, don't give up. Don't give up. Be persistent in prayer. I thank God that our God does not go to sleep. I remember when Elijah went up on, mount, on the mountain to meet with the prophets of Baal. And Elijah was mocking the prophets of Baal. He said, listen, you guys, you, you get your bowl and you put it on your altar and you call upon your God. And they started praying. You see, they were praying to the wrong God. There are people who pray, and they pray sincerely. There are people who do things in sincerity. I see some folks out there selling all kinds of books on the streets, and they think that they're doing God a favor by selling watchtower, selling things. They're going to buy their way to heaven. But if you are praying to the wrong God, you're never going to get the answer you're looking for. This is why in the Bible, we always have Jehovah God written in a big G. And when the, when the Bible talks about other gods, it's all, check it out, it's always in small g's. Because our God, the big G, all right, is a person. He's living. 
He can respond. He has a personality. He talks to us. We talk to him and he hears us. But all of these gods that hang on dashboards, that hang on people's uh, review mirrors and all kinds of things, they are small G gods, all right? They're wood and they're plastic and they're glass and they, they can't talk. And when Elijah told the, 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 the prophets of Baal, listen, I want you guys to go ahead and pray. Go ahead and call on your God. Call the fire down. And he, he said, the Bible says that they started calling, oh, Baal, oh, Baal, come on down and... Baal didn't respond. He said, what happened to your God? Your God like he's gone on, your God like he's gone on a long walk. <laughs> or maybe your God is asleep. Maybe you need to shout a little louder. And their God did not respond. Because, listen, uh, the prophet Elijah knew his God. And he said, God, he, he came and his turn came to uh, call the fire down. He said, that they would know who is the true and the living God. Listen, people. God wants his people prayer because he is the true and the living God. He is the true living God. So ask in the name of Jesus. Ask in faith, believing that God is going to do what you desire, for, uh, you want him to do. Prayer persistently. All right? And... Uh, Remember now that access through to God is no longer towards the east. We don't have to pray, turn to the east in prayer. We don't have to pray in a church. We don't have to pray in a temple. We don't have to pray wearing a specific garment. People come in to put on these little religious robes and their head ties and all kinds of things. Listen, when Paul and Silas were in the jail, they probably were half naked. They probably weren't wearing any clothing. They maybe had a little, a little cloth tied around their loins, and they were beaten, and they were bloody. But the Bible says that they were down there in the dungeon praying unto God. You see, they were praying not from external comforts. They were praying from internal desires. They were praying from their relationship with God. This is why the Word of God says that they that knew that know God, my people that know me, shall be, shall be strong and do exploits for me. Strong and do exploits. You don't have to live in a fancy house. You don't have to drive a fancy car to do exploits for God. All you need to do is to worship God in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, and she said, we, we, we know that you Jews. She's a Samaritan now. She said, you, Samar you Jews don't talk to us. How come you talking to me? She said, I know that you, you, you Jews worship on the mountain, and you Jews, are, you guys are, uh, uh, worship towards Jerusalem. All right? And this is Jesus' response to her in John 4 and, 4, uh, 4 and 12, uh, 20, 21. He said, believe me. Jesus said, believe me. I am telling you that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jesus was talking about this same temple right here that Solomon was praying in. Remember what Jesus, what Solomon said? That... Uh, when I hear your prayer, all right, sorry, let me back up a bit, let me back up a bit. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, you hear from heaven. But we don't have to pray in the temple for God to hear our prayers. It is good to come together because we come together to encourage one another. We come together to edify one another, and we come together to be edified. The Word of God says that steel sharpens steel. There's a reason to be in the house of God. The things that we receive in God's house, when we assemble together that we don't receive, and we, when we stay by ourselves. Amen. People who don't like to come to church are missing out on the blessings of God that he has that can only be received and experienced when we come to worship God in the house of God. You can't worship God in, in spirit and in truth watching a TV screen, all right? Because when you have problems and you need prayer, who are you going to call on? The televangelist? You're going to call on the TV screen? Hmm? We need to assemble ourselves together. But you don't have to call, come together for God to hear your prayer. 
All right. Jesus said that we need a broken and a contrite spirit. We need to be sincere when we come before the Lord. The psalmist said the Lord is near to the broken hearted and he saves such who have a contrite spirit. As I prepare to close, because we do want to pray today, as I prepare to close, we are living in some strange times. This is all I can describe them as. Some strange times. We have global warming affecting every nation in the world. We were down there in the water the other day, and, and the, we heard the announcement that the water at the shore level was 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Passed a call yesterday to, to confirm that we were still coming down for the, for the teaching at the, at the Bible, uh, the, the, the theological school in Grenada. And I asked them, are we going to be teaching in air conditioning? Or are we going to be teaching in a regular room? He said, rest light. So pray for us, please. Global warming is a reality. We have storms. Did you see the effect of this storm? I have been in this country and alive for 66 years now. And I have never seen this type of devastation. Never seen this type of de devastation hurricane. And while I am speaking, there's another hurricane on its way right now in the Gulf of Mexico. And they're already predicting that it's going to be at least another Category 3 hurricane right behind the one that just passed. Tornadoes are forming in places that we've never heard before. Recently, we had one in, in New Jersey. There was one in Long Island recently. Global warming, changes in the climate. There are wars everywhere. Famines and starvation is affecting people by the millions. We have pestilence coming upon us. Some that are known, the, the, the location is known, and some of the, lo some of the locations are, are unknown. America and the nations of the world, listen, are more divided today than any time in history. If you are a student in history, you, will, you, will, you check history, you'll see that uh, uh, there were different groups in certain times. Back in the slave days, there were the free and there were the bond. And the slaves hung out together, and those who were uh, 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 the masters and so forth hung out together. But in these times that we're in, you don't know who your enemy is. Because everybody is divided. There's so much separation. Even in the churches today, there's division. All right? Then we have the unjust and the immoral living that has been normalized and legalized in the world today. Unjust and immoral living has been normalized, legalized today in the world, all right? And the Bible talks about a great falling away in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2. The great falling away is right upon us today. I've never seen so many pastors, whether they fell away, whether they walked away, whether they were put away, or whether they just dropped dead somehow, died somehow. I've never seen so many pastors leave the pulpit as in these past couple of years. And it's, for, it's happening from the top down. Do you agree with me? You, you, you've, seen, you've seen it? It's happening uh, among people who are scholarly. It's happening among the trained. It's happening among the untrained. It's happening among all levels of of, of, of church leaders. It's happening. The Bible tells us that before Christ returns, there's going to be a great falling away, a great apostasy. People calling good evil and evil good. It's happening all around us. But I thank God that something remains constant. Constant. I remember that, I thank God that someone remains constant because our God is immutable. He doesn't change. Our God is unchangeable. And he's observing all the events that are in the world. Right, I'd rather have God as my friend than as my enemy. It's better to have God as your friend than as your enemy. All right? And finally, the God that we serve is merciful. He's gracious. And he is forgiven. He is still saying today, he is still saying the same thing. 
The conditions may be a little different. The circumstances may be somewhat different. But God is still saying, if my people yes. would only pray. Yes. Prayer today is the same as when Moses was alive. Prayer today is just as important as when Nehemiah was around or the prophets were around. Amen. You know, you, we can't talk to the, to the men of all, but we can do some things that they did. And in fact, we have greater access now to the, to the throne of heaven because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, yes. and we have a mediator. Back then, they only had a priest, and the priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year. But today, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, yes. and we can talk to the Lord at any and all times. Yes. God is calling us to prayer. And I want to let the church know today that we have been given an opportunity to go on ear for prayer. Who, those of you who remember the 40 days of prayer that we had a couple of years ago, how many remember the 40 days of prayer? We are still being told, you know what, that prayer that you encountered, that you engaged in, along with the other prayers, so we don't take the credit for everything, change circumstances. That same radio station that we had the advert advertisement on called this past week and said, you know, we need prayer for such a time as this. We need prayer for such a time as this. And they said, you know, that name sounds good. They said they needed someone to come on the air to pray just for one minute. Yeah. One minute. And uh, I said, you know what? The Lord has been laying on my heart. People have been asking us, what are we going to do this year about prayer? And I said, uh, the Lord hasn't laid up on my heart to, to do the 40 days as we did in the past. Mm -hmm. But when the invitation was given and the need was put out there for such a time as this, we have about 30 days before the election. I saw a news flash that says President Biden says that he cannot guarantee a violence-free election this year. This is the first time, and I've been in this country now for 40 Five going on 46 years. He says, I, as the president, cannot guarantee a violence-free election this year. So we are living in critical times. We need to pray, people. We need to pray. And you don't have to be in the midst of the violence to get caught up in it if it occurs. And so we're going to pray because the call has come. And the station told me, you're, you're, the, first, you're the first person that came to their, their mind to call. You see, sometimes you, you just do what God tells you to do, and you don't know the long-term impact that it has on people. Yeah. We can be praying wherever the station is heard for that period of time. And I'm asking Destiny Cathedral to stand together. Right now, we're scheduled to go on every morning at 8 a.m. for one minute of prayer. All right? And uh, we're going to name it Standing in the Gap. Listen up, for, listen up for the announcement. Standing in the gap. Two days ago, the Lord woke me up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and he started giving me the things that we need to be praying about, because this has to be well-structured, well-prepared. We can't be going faltering and helter-skelter. It has to be targeted prayer. We're going to be praying about all the different needs that we have in this country, and in the world for that period of time. And it, it, it costs. It costs because these things do cost. They have to have the engineers and the technicians and the people. Everything costs. Because many people don't realize that things cost. So if the Lord moves on your heart to give any special contributions towards this, and it's going to be on for only from the 14th of this month, October, through until the 3rd of January. We're just taking that, that's a lot of time because that's, we sense that that's a critical time. As we approach the election, as we are, are facing all of these natural disasters around us, as we are in the midst of this crisis in the Middle East, and as we prepare uh, to go into the new year, the Lord said, we're going to just take this segment, this segment from October 14th through to January 3rd. All right? And so I want to ask the church to stand with us. I want to ask you to come at this time. Come at this time and stand with us. Come and stand. As we look to the Lord. As we look to the Lord today. If my people pray. 
who would ever think that this small gathering will be called upon to lead the city in prayer and possibly the nation in prayer because this station can, can be picked up anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country. I want to ask the, the congregation to come on down. Come on down and stand here in the front because we want to we want to lead you in prayer. We want to lead in a session of prayers. We prepare to close today. Spend at least the next five minutes or so as the Lord will direct us and lead us in prayer. And we want to focus for the next couple of Sundays on the topic, the, the matter of prayer up until election time. Listen, we're not getting up at six in the morning as we did a couple of years ago. It doesn't mean that we have to do things the same way all the time. Because God is a God of change. Amen? But he's the God of prayer. Hallelujah. Let's look to the Lord today. Almighty God, we come to you, Lord. We come to you in the mighty name of your holy child, Jesus Christ. As your word has instructed us, Lord, to call upon you in the time of trouble. Lord, we have uh, uh, read a litany of situations that the world is facing. We may not have been impacted by this storm, Helene, but God, who knows what will come next week or next month? Who knows what will come our way? And so, Lord, we come standing in the gap today on behalf of of our church the body of christ here locally on behalf of the church universal on behalf of the church wherever people are calling upon you oh god we ask you lord to cover the body of christ we know your word says that you shall build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it and so god we have this confidence that regardless of what comes our way you are built in nevertheless. We know, Lord, that you have a way of causing your people to come closer to you as we face trials, as we face pressures of life, as we encounter difficulties, Lord. But Lord, we pray today that it will not have to come to this. We pray, God, it wouldn't have to come to a famine or a pestilence. It wouldn't have to come to another uh, external army attacking us in some way, oh God. But Lord, your people will draw near to you in these times of difficulty. Lord, we lift up our nation to you today. We lift up our leaders to you. We lift up the president, the vice president. We lift up the candidates, oh God, that are right now slated to run for office and are running for office. We ask, Lord, that your perfect will will be done in all these situations. Because your word says, if my people, if my people, with prayer, Lord. And so, Lord, we come in obedience to your word, asking you to intervene, Lord. Let your perfect will be done on November 5th. 2024 Lord we pray for a peaceful a peaceful election season in our country we see how Lord there are so many assassinations in the history of uh, the nation right next door to us Mexico Lord there have been so many assassinations of, of presidential candidates and, and also presidents there oh God but we ask Lord that this situation is not such that we shall encounter, we would encounter here in our country. We ask, Lord, that you would surround our leaders with wise counselors. Your word reminds us that in the, in the presence of counselors, there is safety. In the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. We pray, Lord, that our leaders will surround themselves with, with, with men and women who would fear you. Or who would at least seek your counsel? Seek counsel from spiritual advisors who are grounded in the word of God. That they will be given counsel according to your word. Because your word says that when the righteous are in power, the people rejoice. But when those who engage in wickedness are in leadership, the people groan. And so, Lord, we pray that you would... Give us a smooth election season. Give us, oh God, a peaceful election season. Give us, oh God, a peaceful transition 
of power, Lord God, of leadership in our nation, remembering our senators and congressmen, remembering our governors today, Lord God, remembering our people at every level of leadership, those people who are leading our colleges and the schools, the people who are heading the various departments in Washington, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us people of integrity. People, Lord God, who will do what is right when the light is on and, the, and do what is right when the lights are off. People who will do what is right when the eyes are upon them. And people who will do the things that demonstrate integrity when no one is watching. Oh God, we lift up our nation today. We lift up our homes, oh God, fathers and mothers. We lift up marriages to you today. We ask, oh God, that you would take control of our homes. Cause us, Lord God, to be more neighborly with our neighbors. Cause us to have love one for another. That we would not love people because they speak our language or dialect. We will not just love people because they look like us or they're from our country. But Lord, we will love people because they are our brothers and our sisters. Your word reminds us, Lord God, how can we say that we love a God that we have never seen, but yet we do not love people that we can see and touch and feel and talk to and minister to? God, we lift up the wars that are happening around the world right now. Your word commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, oh God. Lord, we pray for peace in this part of the world. We know, Lord God, that Jerusalem is the, the center of your clock for the world's events. And even as we examine what are, are the things that are happening there, oh God, we see that your word is being fulfilled. But Lord, despite the fact that these things must come to pass, we lift up Jerusalem, Lord God. We lift up the leaders of this country. We lift up the Palestinians, oh God. We lift up the people, Lord God, and the nations that surround Jerusalem, surround Israel. We ask, oh God, that somehow you will send a wave of peace in this nation. That somehow, Lord God, you will cause these, these two uh, nationalities, even though they're brothers, to come to recognize that there's only one God. One God one God who is worthy to be worshipped one God who is worthy to be served one God who does not desire that anyone should perish but everyone should come to repentance one God who sent his son into the world to die for the sins of all humanity oh God we pray today we pray for those who are impoverished in the poor nations of the country, we pray of the world, we pray for Haiti, oh God. We pray, oh God, for Venezuela, who's not poor by choice, but they're poor by intention because they've been isolated. Haiti is, being, is poor because they have been isolated. Cuba is poor because they have been isolated. We pray for all the nations of the world, oh God, that the, the Western world, the power brokers have turned their backs against, Lord God. We pray for their salvation as well. Because John 3.16 reminds us that God, you so loved the world. You didn't say you so loved the, the Palestinians. You didn't say you so loved the, 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 the Arabs or the Jews. You, you loved the world. You loved everyone. You loved everyone, Lord God. And this is the gospel. Lord, we pray that the hatred we have for another, even on our streets, by God, will be removed. That we will be able to, we will be able to come together and talk about our differences and forgive each other and reconcile and bring healing, Lord God. That the, the wealth of this country and the countries of the world will be distributed, Lord God, more equally. We pray, oh God, that instead of spending money on bombs and guns and weapons, that more money would be spent on education and health care, my God, and, and housing for those who are homeless. We pray for those who are homeless today, oh God, living on the streets. Jesus, Jesus, it was for these that you died. 
We pray for people who are locked away in prison. Many of them are in prison and didn't commit a crime. Jesus, have mercy upon the prisoners. Have mercy upon those who are bound and the outcasts. Jesus, have mercy. Have mercy, Lord. Remember your people, Lord God, who are facing financial difficulties today. We ask, Lord, that you open the windows of heaven and pour blessings upon them, that they wouldn't have room enough to receive of your goodness. But Lord, today our most important prayer is we pray for the souls of men. We pray for the souls of anyone in this church today who may not know you today as Lord and Savior. But the most important prayer that we can pray is to invite Jesus Christ into our hearts, to make him the Lord of our lives. That's the most important prayer that we can pray. Your word reminds us that what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose the most valuable possession that he has, his soul. Oh my God. I pray, Lord, that our understanding of values will be changed, will be set in the kingdom priority, in the kingdom order, Lord God, that we, we will set our priorities right. We will not squander our lives on this earth chasing after things that we cannot keep. We will not waste our time on this earth, Lord God. But, Lord, we will spend more time seeking you. We will spend more time serving you. We will spend more time letting our lights shine before men that they will see our good works and that our Father in heaven will be glorified. And we will spend more time, Lord God, crying out to you because your words if my people with prayer. I want to invite you now to just open your mouths and talk to the Lord for a few moments. Just, just open your mouth right where you are. Talk to the Lord about any personal situations that you're dealing with. Talk to the Lord about your relationships. Talk to the Lord about your children. Talk to the Lord about your marriage. Talk to the Lord about your job situation. Hallelujah. Because we've come in obedience and we've called upon the Lord. And he says, listen, there's no good thing that he will withhold from them who would be obedient to him, in other words. Lord, we pray that our supplication to you, Lord, will be acceptable, will have been received. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's open our mouths and talk to the Lord today for a few moments. Talk to the Lord today, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We cry to you, Lord, today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Turn things around, Lord God, in this world. Turn things around, Lord God. You did it in the past, and you are the same today, yesterday, and forever you and you remain the same. Turn things around, Lord God. So maybe if you're here today, you say, Pastor, I, I don't know Christ as my Savior. I've never prayed that most important prayer to invite Christ to be the Lord of my life. And you'll say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want to pray that prayer. I want to pray that prayer. I want to pray that prayer, inviting Christ to be the Lord of my life. Is there one person? Okay, okay. Everyone here is born again. Everyone here is saved. Okay, we, we bless God. We give God thanks. Come on, let's give God some praise. Let's give him some praise. The Word of God says that the Lord inhabits, inhabits, inhabits the praises his people. Someone here, just don't move us yet. Someone here, someone here is about to make, or is positioned to make a very, very important decision. I don't know what it's about specifically. And I know that in life we always have decisions, but someone, you have a very important decision to make today, very, very soon. I pray, God, that, Lord, you would give this individual the sense of your presence and the peace of God that only your peace gives when they choose your will, your ways, your direction, your purpose. 
But Lord, they will experience the blessings of God in their life. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace both now or through Christ come. And everyone says, amen. Yeah, we can get in the communion. Thank you, sis. You, you may return to your places. We got so caught up in the prayer. We are going to go into the communion part of our service at this time. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Communion is for every single believer. Every believer is welcome to come to the communion table to partake of the emblems. Communion does not save you, will not save you. Baptism is an opportunity for you to testify that you're saved. Communion is an opportunity for you to testify that you are continuing in your walk with the Lord. So, we've been warned in the Word of God to examine our hearts before we partake. Because some people partake sin, known sin in their lives, and there are consequences for doing that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, so when, so then whenever you eat, whoever eats the bread and the drink, and drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, you'll be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. And I believe that we have already examined ourselves before the Lord. I trust we have done that. And uh, we can ask God's blessings on the emblems even now. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence among us. We thank you for reminding us that we need to pray even more. We thank you, oh God, that we have your spirit indwelling us to show us whether our walk is according to your word or word or whether it's contrary to your word. And Lord, if there's anything, anything at all that is contrary in our lives, we ask you to forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us today and wash us. Purify us. Purify our hands and our feet. Purify our thoughts, our minds, our memories, oh God. As we come to the table today, cleanse us and wash us. We come, Lord, today in faith, believing that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. In Jesus' name, amen. And worshipers are going to sing at this time, lead us in song as the emblems are distributed. Praise God. I also pass on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed he took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and he said take this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me let us partake of the emblem that is symbolic of Christ's broken body together he was wounded for us he was bruised for us. He sacrificed his life for us. 
Can we say thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new cup in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we remember you as we partake of the emblem that is representative of your shed blood right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let me say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was laid upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So we know it was the blood. We just know it was the blood that did the work in our lives. Oh, I know it was the blood. a little different today but the benediction has been shared already so I want to challenge you to speak to meet at least five persons before you go through the doors and say it's good to see you brother in the house of the Lord God bless you have a good week in the Lord all right we at least five persons you can go to more of them but at least five persons before you leave the house today I'm gonna, I'm gonna read these first three God bless you